to see you here this morning. I want to read to you a portion of one of my favorite psalms, which is Psalm 119. And it says this, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word, O oh Lord, I have treasured in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. Let us uh, sing this morning. If you have a mass, that is. Uh, otherwise, you can just sit and hum the words or, or just enjoy listening this morning. I will boast in Christ alone.
a material object representing the deity to which religious worship is directed. Now, much like last week, we're going to see that this is going to apply to us today. Last week we, should, we talked about having no other gods before me. And an idol is something I think that we would all say that we don't have any idols in our lives. I'm sure we would all say that. But again, like last week, we began to took a closer look at the, what it meant and found out indeed we may be worshipping other gods in our lives. And we might find today that we too may have an idol in our closet. Idols were a huge part of the ancient Near East, the time when Moses was around. And we must keep in mind the history of where the people of Israel were, were coming out of and what they understood as they came out of Egypt. Remember, they were in Egypt for 400 years. And in Egypt they had all kinds of gods. They had the sun god, the moon god, they had lion gods, the pharaohs were gods, they had just a plethora of gods, and they had images of all of these gods for the people to look at and say, here is our god. We worship this, our god. All the Egyptian gods were tangible because they could see them, because they made these, these lofty images of their gods. They could touch them and uh, caress them and see what they felt like. Uh, they had an object, in other words, to worship. And the people of Israel wanted that too. Remember Moses when he was at the burning bush? Moses was out tending the sheep, minding his own business. It's just a regular day in his life, tending the flock, and he sees a burning bush. And at first he pretty much ignores it and just keeps an eye on it, makes sure it doesn't spread kind of thing. And after a while, he notices that this bush isn't burning out. It's continuing to burn. So he goes over to the bush, as we know, and when he's standing before the bush, he meets the living God. And God tells Moses that he, Moses, was going to lead the people of Israel out of captivity out of Egypt. And if you know the story well at all, Moses didn't jump at that opportunity. He didn't want to be the leader to lead people out of Israel. As a matter of fact, he came up with excuse after excuse after excuse, praying and begging God to choose somebody else because he didn't want to do the job. And one of the questions Moses asked God during that exchange was, if people ask me, what is your name, what am I to say? Because you weren't one of the gods of Egypt. We don't know who you are. We had uh, idols to worship. Who are you? We don't see you. And God tells them, tell them that I am has sent you. Now, I don't know about you, but as a, at a casual glance, that doesn't satisfy me one bit. What in the world does I am mean? For 400 years, Israel had seen the Egyptian gods. For 400 years, they had known the names of the gods, known what the image of their gods looked like. What in the world is I am? See, I am is a descriptor of essence. Not one of us here today, in this sanctuary, or even listening online, can say of themselves that I am. Not one of us can. In this little name, there is a claim of self-essence. I am says that I have no beginning and no end. I am says I am dependent on nothing and no one. You and I are completely and utterly dependent on our parents. <laughs> we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for our parents. God is dependent on no one. He is fully self-evident. He, he isn't in need of any external forces. You and I need food. You and I need sleep. You and I need exercise. You and I need our parents, as I said. 
We are dependent. And the I am says, I am completely independent. This was to be Israel's God. All the gods of Egypt were dead gods. They were, as a matter of fact, they were all made, as we know, by the great I am. Although he didn't craft them himself, but they're images of things that God created. They can't do anything. But Israel's God was the one and true God, all powerful, all majestic. As a matter of fact, all Egyptian gods were dependent on the great I Am. But the problem was the people of Israel could not see the great I Am. They wanted to see something. They wanted to worship something. So what did they do? The first chance they get, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn down over to Exodus chapter 32. We have an interesting story here. When Moses comes off the, the mountain with the Ten Commandments, Exodus 32. And I want to read for you verses 1 to 5. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled around Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, this man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we, don't, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a great with a graving tool and made it into a mobile calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And we can go on, but we're going to stop there. Uh, Moses was taking a lot more time on the mountain than the people uh, could handle. And they were getting impatient. And what happens when we get impatient, folks? We start to do things on our own. I remember in high school taking shop class. And one of the things was we were allowed to, we were going to use a lathe. You know, that thing that spins and you take the thing and go around it. And uh, the teacher said, don't any of you ever start that lathe up without letting me check it to make sure everything is done right. So I got my turn to go on the lathe finally, and the teacher was busy, and I waited, and he's busy, and they waited, and waited, and waited. And I finally got fed up waiting for him. So I flicked the machine on and started working. Well, sure, shoot, I didn't do one of the bolts up. And right in the middle of my going across, that piece of wood went flying in the air. Fortunately for me, <laughs> I didn't get knocked on the head. I probably should have, but <laughs> I didn't. But we get impatient when, when things don't happen the way we like and we take things into our own hands. And they got impatient with Moses and they got impatient with God. And when we get impatient, we tend to go on our own wisdom and insights. And what was the wisdom of the people? Let's make an image. Just like we had back in Egypt. Let's make an image of God so that we have something tangible to worship. They wanted to be just like the people of Egypt. They wanted something visible, something tangible that they can say, here is our God. Now I want you to notice something that I never noticed till this week. If you still have your Bibles open there, look at verse 4 says this, this is your God of Israel who brought you out from the land of Egypt. The people of Israel were saying they're making an image of the living God. This is God who did it for us. They were still wanted to worship that God, but they wanted him to be tangible. They wanted to see him. And they were crediting this image to God. But notice in your Bibles, the word God for, for, uh, in describing that image is a small g. Because it wasn't the God of Israel. He is unseen. 
No longer by having an image was it the true God, but it was a sacrilegious God. God will have no image of himself. How can it, you give an image to a spirit? If you make an image of God that is made from the thoughts of, you, of our own mind, and, that, and it is limited to the Creator's uh, thoughts and thinking, and it will always fall short of who God is. It will it'll never capture the, catch the essence of God Almighty. And what are some of the things that have God-like status in our lives. Now, this may not apply to everyone, every one of these situations, but some may. It may be a different name or a different face or whatever, but it may apply. Most of you are old enough, and I am not. I mean, I was alive, but I didn't know who they were at the time. But you're old enough to remember when the Beatles arrived in North America. And I see news clips about it today. People were nuts. They, they practically bowed down and worshipped these guys. They were crying and fainting and all kinds of crazy things. People did that and still do it over Elvis Presley today. The king of rock and roll. They go bonkers over the guy. And they still go to Graceland to worship him. Uh, and many Christians, and we may not like this, I don't know how sensitive this will be to you, many Christians wear crosses. Let's talk about that for a second. Having a cross around your neck, per se, is not necessarily a problem. But if you are using that cross as a channel to get to God, to use its energy to get you to God, it is an idol. That cross is simply made by somebody. It has no magical powers. And if it is used as a tool of worship, it is an idol. If it's just dangling there, and you use it if somebody sees you with it on, and you want to tell them about Jesus, that's, that's fine. And just be careful how you use that cross hanging on your neck. See, what, whatever we make as a symbol of worship, is something that we like to control. What we make, we control. We cannot control God. God is otherworldly. If you have your Bibles with you, again, I want you to turn to Hebrews with me. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 11. And I want to ask us the question, what is faith? Why do we have belief, or, or for lack of a better word, a religion that is based on faith? Let's see what this text has to say for us. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, the convictions of things not seen. God wants you and I to trust Him in faith. People who can look back and say, I believe in God because He has done such and such for me over the years, and He's walked with me, and He's been intimate with me, and I've learned that I can trust God by faith. We can't have images of God. We must believe in faith. Just like all the people mentioned, if you continue on in Hebrews 11, all it's the great hallmark of faith is Hebrews chapter 11, all the men who follow God in faith. I find it ironic that the Islamic faith seek to kill people who attempt to make images of Allah or Muhammad. And yet Christians, we don't even bat an eye when people take the Lord's name in vain, OMG all the time, and make images and tell nasty and dirty jokes about God and so forth. We don't bat an eye. 
You know, I believe all humanity has within them the need to worship a God. If that were not true, why would there be thousands upon thousands of religions in this world today? People need to express their love for a God. God has placed within everyone the desire to know a living God. And humankind has made all kinds of images. From cows to lions to people, all kinds of silly images to worship instead of the living God who has no images to be worshipped. Humans within us need to worship. And therefore, we create idols. You ever see people dangle on, on their uh, mirrors in the car, a lucky rabbit's foot? I'm not sure what's so lucky about it. I mean, that rabbit wasn't too lucky, if you ask me. We have all kinds of idols. We have idols of images. We have idols of people. And thirdly, we have idols, oh, I hate this one. And I really didn't even want to talk about it, because it hits a little too close to home. Some people have idols of food, folks. A lot of us do. You know, I probably wouldn't be a diabetic today if I didn't have chocolate bars so much. <laughs> and when you're young, of course, you think you're absolutely invincible, that you're going to get absolutely nothing in life, never be sick. I never thought in my wildest dreams I'd have the trouble getting down and pull my socks up in the morning. That's something old people have trouble with. And all of a sudden, guess what? I have trouble getting those nasty old socks on in the morning. Uh, and I lived in Montreal. As you know, I was born and raised in Montreal. And every street corner seemed to have a hot dog and french fry uh, joined on the corner. And boy, did I like to visit them on a regular occasion. And they don't make hot dogs like they make here, let me tell you. They make good hot dogs. <laughs> and I eat those hot dogs and french fries with no consideration of my future or what they were doing to my health. Food is an idol, my friends, for so many of us. If truth be told, and this is a hard one to say because it's my own personal sin, obesity is a sin of self, no self-control. Now I know there are, there is a condition out there where some people have a gene that tells them they were never full. And for those folks, I'm not talking to them today. That is a horrible disease, and I feel so sorry for those people, and may God bless them. But for the rest of us folks, we got no reason for it, other than we like to stuff stuff in our face uh, to fulfill our personal desires. Turn with me to Colossians. Colossians, and this is hard to choose one text today, so just Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Again, so many passages. Verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly bodies as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. And it goes on from there, and we can speak of many other texts as well. Another God, another idol in our culture today, and this is probably the biggest one I can think of, other than self, is the God of sex. It's the God of sex. I can't think of anything else more pressing in our culture today that is affecting the Christian church just as strongly as it is affecting those outside the church. And I am finding those within the church are getting angry when you express biblical moralities and saying, get with the times within the church. Let me make it clear to all of us adults, to any young people that are sitting here today, and to those who may be listening via in the internet, premarital sex is sinful. It is wrong. 
Your bodies as Christians are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you are to treat your body with dignity and respect because it belongs to God. Your sexuality is between you and your spouse, period. And let me also make it clear that living together before marriage is also sinful. Don't do it. I've heard countless stories of young Christian girls trying to find Christian men on these dating sites and when they get talking and so forth, the first thing that happens is these men or boys, young men, whatever, will send off private pi pictures of their uh, private parts. Right away, Christian men. Ladies, you are beautiful and precious in God's sight. Don't succumb to the wicked and evil sexual desires of those young men who all they want to do is hop into bed with you. If they love you and are claiming to be a Christian, they will respect your body as holy unto God first. If you are a Christian today, you are precious in God's sight. And don't buy into the devil's lies that premarital sex is no big deal. You know, if premarital sex was no big deal, why is it so many young ladies who uh, engage in premarital sex have great anxiety, have great depression, have committed suicide, have gotten themselves pregnant and are scared to death as their future is what they're going to do? If it was no big deal, why would these be the result for so many people? Honor God with your bodies, girls and boys. Be men. Stand up and be men. Here's the thing. God made us. We don't make Him. When we as people make someone, again as I said earlier, we have made something that is limited. It is limited by our imagination. It is limited by time. It is limited by our resources. And any image we create falls short of truly who God is. Another thing, anything we make, we admire. Last, this past week, I had to do some work on my motorcycle. First time, and my son came up and he helped me with it a little bit. And I had never done work on my bike before. I'd never seen a bike to work on one before. And I had no idea what I was doing. Thank the Lord for YouTube, because it really did help. And I watched several videos. I must have watched the same video four or five times on how to fix what I needed to fix. And when I was done, I was pretty proud. <laughs> I was pretty proud. I saved myself three or four hundred dollars. Now, I didn't build a bike by any means. But I did something that seemed pretty spectacular to me. Here's the thing. What we build, we admire. Now for you, it probably isn't working on a motorcycle that will get you excited. But for others, we have other ways of idols we may have. We may be creative and crafty in something, I don't know. We can all have all kinds of idols in our lives, things that make us proud. Others have crosses around their neck. And again, it's not bad uh, if it's just hanging there, the thing of just crafty, but if we're doing it to get in God's space, like we talked about last week, remember? God doesn't want anything in our space. His space, rather. We can't make an image of God because there's nothing we can build that represents God. Nothing we can build, we can admire that represents God. God doesn't want us admiring or worshiping images. He wants us by faith, by faith to worship Him, to have faith in the unseen. It is, has it ever crossed your mind why did God not allow certain relics from biblical times to endure until today? Why is it we don't have one single shred of the original 
languages of the New Testament. Not one single shred. Why is it we don't have the words that were nailed on top of Jesus on the cross, uh, Jesus, King of the Jews? Why don't we have any of these relics? I think we don't have them because God knows that as human beings we tend to worship these things. And we, for example, are at great odds with the Catholic Church or worshiping idols. They worship idols, we don't. And as I said earlier, anything we build, we control. If we were to worship that cross, it's only made by human hands. It is made of mere material. Certainly it falls short of the infinite, invisible God. We don't make images because we want to control images. We cannot control God. He is not that ace up your sleeve, you might say, that we pull out when we want to trump something or somebody. He created us. Never forget we are His objects, if we can use that term, of His doing, not vice versa. Idols also imply that God has physicality, but he doesn't. I want you to turn with me, if you've got your Bibles again, to Deuteronomy, chapter 4. Deuteronomy, chapter 4. I want to read for you verses 11 and 12. You came near and stood at the front of the mountain. And the mountain burned with fire to the very heart of the heavens. Darkness, cloud, and thick gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. They saw no form. God wants us to worship Him by faith. Not by some image. So what does this all imply then at the end of the day? How then does this idol talk speak into our lives? When the people of Israel went about their lives, there were certain times that God had had them build rock piles. I've mentioned this I think before. They would often build rock piles of 12 rocks representing the 12 tribes of Israel as they went about things in life and God delivered them from things. For example, when they uh, crossed the Jordan River, when they were halfway through, God said, put 12 rock piles in the middle of the river as a remembrance. And they made other rock piles excuse me, along the way. And the thing was, when they were walking by those rock piles in the future with their children and families, they were, tell, they were to tell the story to their children as to how God met their needs. Do you have a story to tell? I believe you all do. A story that you can share. Our God is an unseen God, but He has spoken into your life. You have confessed your sin and you've put your faith in Jesus Christ. We are perfect. Boy, do we all know that. But you and I are witnesses to this living God every day of our lives. Our attitude, and if, when we go to work, our attitude reflects who we are as Christians. People will be pointing to God, not because we have a cross hanging around our necks, because people have met Jesus Christ through your life. God wants to use you. As we struggle as a church to find God's direction for our church, we need to come in prayer first. Or we're just getting ahead of God. We must come and we must humble ourselves and confess our sins to God. Friends, every one of us is sinful. Every one of us has broken every one of the Ten Commandments. But God wants to use us. And I don't believe God is finished with this church. And He wants to bless this church and use it to reach this community for Jesus. 
Perhaps the idol for us has been the church building itself. If we build it, they will come. Well, they're not interested in the church. Our building is no big deal. The people outside the church. But your life is a fantastic witness of the expression of God in your life. And people will meet God as they meet you. Isn't that an awesome and privileged responsibility God gives us all? That's amazing. Again, we will see that we fail in each of the commandments, but God's grace and love is far greater than every one of these Ten Commandments that we are still to try to follow. If God is the God of your life, be careful of idols. Be careful from celebrities, worshiping them, sports celebrities even, whatever it may be. Careful that the things you do do not become idols. Let us worship our God in faith as a God of spirit who is unseen speaks to us through his word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful this day for your grace towards us. And I pray, Father, that today there are, are no idols in our lives, but for certain there are some people here today who have some idols in their closets. And it could be anything and some things I haven't even mentioned today be our idols. Lord, they are only things. Let us be mindful, Lord, that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we are to live for you, that we are to be holy unto you in our actions. Lord, I just pray that you would point something out in our lives that we can work on and surrender unto you as our Lord, because you've given us the ability to overcome these things, because your Holy Spirit lives in us. Just bless these words for your glory, I pray in Christ's name.
his church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever.